So I'm an obstetrician, I specialise in maternal fetal medicine, so I care for mothers and their babies experiencing significant complications in their pregnancy. But I also get the joy of doing a lot of research alongside the clinical work that I undertake, and it's some of that research targeting placental insufficiency that I want to talk to you about today. And so I want to start, I'm sorry it's just before the afternoon tea break, um, but with a picture of the organ that I personally find incredibly fascinating um, and I think is a bit underappreciated in general. But this is a sanitised version of a placenta that we're looking at here. It's absolutely amazing in that when this develops normally and when it fulfils its role, it's capable of nurturing and assisting with the development of new life of a healthy baby, hopefully born to a healthy mother at term. However, the placenta is also very capable of causing significant harm when that development doesn't happen normally. And we can see this in the common complications of preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction and stillbirth. And it's the first of these two that I want to touch on today. So to give you an overview of how prevalent these problems are in our community, preeclampsia is extremely common. One in 13 women having their pregnancies here in Australia will have that pregnancy complicated by preeclampsia. And this equates to a bit over 26,500 Australian women every year. Now we're lucky in a country like this where that does lead to significant morbidity for the mother, but unfor and unfortunately about three of those women in Australia every year will go on to join the 64,000 women around the world that die from this condition. And preeclampsia continues to remain responsible for one in five direct maternal deaths around the world. It's also directly responsible for about half a million perinatal deaths around the world. And this is mainly due to the effects of stillbirth, fetal growth restriction, but also premature birth. In comparison, fetal growth restriction is a little bit harder to pin down, mainly because we struggle to agree on a definition for fetal growth restriction. We think on average in Australia about 9% of pregnancies are complicated by this, and that equates to about 28,000 babies born in Australia affected. And of those, about one in eight babies that die in the early third trimester are due to fetal growth restriction. So it is a common problem that I encounter on a daily basis. Around the world, about 30 million babies are affected by growth restriction, and this causes significant issues with stillbirth. But as I'll mention later, and as Susie will touch on next, it also sets these children up actually for a life impaired by medical comorbidities. So coming to think first about preeclampsia, I've been blessed to be able to work with um, some of Australia's leading clinician academics in this space. So I did a PhD with Professor <coughs> Stephen Tong, who heads up the Translational Obstetrics Group over at Mercy Health with the University of Melbourne. And then uh, in my post-PhD life, I returned to Monash um, for my clinical role, but also working alongside Professor Ewan Wallace there, um, who heads up the Department of ONG. And I want to just take you through some of the aspects of my research that I've done over the years, trying to understand better the underlying pathophysiology that underpins the disease in the hope that we can try and identify new targets for therapy developments, but also how we might be able to use this knowledge to improve the way that we predict or diagnose women that will go on to develop preeclampsia. And lastly, just touch on some of the promising new therapies that we're translating through to clinical research. But first, I just want to give you an overview of where our current understanding of preeclampsia sits. So we broadly define this as two main phenotypes, early and late onset, which are fairly crudely defined by the gestation at which the disease is diagnosed. In terms of that early onset disease, though, the underlying pathophysiology behind it is quite different. This is really a placental disorder. In the non-pregnant state, you're looking here at a cross-section of the non-pregnant uterine wall, and the blood supply through to the endometrium is these tightly coiled spiral arterioles that really have very low flow through them, very high resistance vessels. In normal pregnancy, the placenta actually invades into that uterine wall quite substantially down to the inner third of the myometrial lining. And in doing so, it completely replaces and remodels the sp these spiral arterioles, removing their smooth muscle, replacing their endothelial cell lining, and turning these vessels now into very low resistance, high flow caliper vessels, capable of delivering the 600 mils a minute that we see through to the placental vascular bed to support the growing fetus. 
In comparison, in preeclampsia, we see shallow invasion of the placenta occurring. So it's no longer making it down into that inner third of the myometrium. These vessels are retaining some of their vasoactive capabilities. Um, they're much more high resistance and we see a reduction in the amount of blood flow getting through to that placental bed. As a result, we see increased hypoxia throughout the placental bed, areas of ischemia, reperfusion injuries and infarction. And this has direct consequences for the developing fetus. But we also see that this placenta releases a number of factors into the maternal bloodstream. And some of these factors that we are increasingly understanding are these anti-angiogenic proteins, soluble FLT1 and soluble endoglin. These go on to cause widespread endothelial dysfunction without the maternal vascular system. And this is then what we're able to detect as clinicians as the clinical features of preeclampsia, where these mothers go on to develop hypertension, significant end organ dysfunction, but also evidence of fetoplacental insufficiency, mainly in the form of growth restriction. In comparison, late onset disease is more a condition of underlying pre-existing subclinical endothelial dysfunction, whereby these women actually have normal placental development we do see a release of anti-angiogenic proteins across pregnancy from that placenta into the maternal bloodstream. And in these women that have already a degree of pre-existing endothelial dysfunction, these normal rises in anti-angiogenic proteins across gestation appear to be enough to tip them over into overt endothelial dysfunction and the clinical features of preeclampsia. So these women typically have high BMIs, they might have a history of chronic hypertension, diabetes and other medical comorbidities that we have recognised as risk factors for the development of preeclampsia. And so during my PhD I had looked at a number of ways to try and better understand why, how, the, how these proteins are actually being produced. And so endoglin, soluble endoglin, is really mainly seen in the severe end of the preeclamptic phenotype and we know that it is the result of a cell surface um, membrane protein, endoglin, which forms part of our transforming growth factor beta receptor complex. The membrane bound endoglin is required for the efficient binding of TGF beta to that receptive complex and helping to relay the signal. And what we were able to show is that actually in the placenta, another cell surface membrane known as matrix metalloproteinase 14 is able to recognise a very specific sequence on the extracellular domain of endoglin and actually cleave it at that point. So soluble endoglin is actually a cleavage protein from that membrane bound um, normal protein. The soluble version then is still able to efficiently bind to TGF beta and in doing so actually antagonises its action so it's no longer able to bind to its normal cell surface receptor and contribute to the development of endothelial dysfunction in this way. And this has been quite useful because we were able to show in the laboratory that actually if we could impair this interaction, we could reduce the production of soluble endoglin and that this holds promise as a future therapeutic to minimise the severe end of the preeclamptic spectrum. And indeed, this has led to ongoing research in that field. The other protein that I mentioned is soluble FLT1. So this is a soluble form of the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor type 1. It binds to vascular endothelial growth factor and placental growth factor. And unlike endoglin, is not a product of cleavage, it's a product of alternative splicing. So as such, it shares a 100% sequence homology with the bulk of the extracellular domain of the FLT1 membrane bound receptor complex protein but has a unique C-terminal region, which is what helps to differentiate it. And multiple splice variants have been identified, and these are two that are known to be increased in women with preeclampsia. So a few, quite a few years ago, at the start of my PhD, the E15A variant had just been identified. And this is quite interesting because this one is a quite a novel introduction to our genome. And so we actually only see it in higher, higher order primates and humans, which are the two species in which preeclampsia has actually been observed. And so I sought to kind of really focus on this variant to try and understand one, why are, how is soluble FLIT actually produced and how we might be able to utilise this information to improve our clinical care.
So we were able to show that in the placenta, um, there's a protein known as Jumanji domain containing protein 6, which plays an important role in helping to regulate the splicing machinery. So under normal cellular conditions, Jumanji is able to produce its normal enzymatic oxygen dependent effects, where it hydro hydroxylates a component of the splicing machinery, U2A of 65. This then directs the splicing machinery to transcribe the FLT1 pre-mRNA to produce that full-length membrane-bound FLT1 protein. In comparison, under hypoxic conditions such as what we see in the preeclamptic placenta, Jumanji is no longer able to exert its oxygen-dependent effects, and as such, U2AF65 remains unhydroxylated and now directs the splicing machinery more to the production of soluble transcripts um, through alternative splicing. So we were able to, to show that this is the mechanism that's happening within the placenta and identify in that way potentially new novel approaches whereby we might be able to manipulate this system. Interestingly, we also found that when we looked at samples from preeclamptic women, that Jumanji not only was inhibited, which is what we were actually expecting, but that its expression also is significantly altered. Uh, and so this has led into ongoing work as well. So. I tried to, uh, to assess this further at a protein level as well, and unfortunately there are no commercially available products at all uh, in this range, so I had to set about actually making them. So we were able to actually make antibodies that target these, particularly, these particular splice variants, as well as purified protein to actually test the antibodies on. And while we weren't able to show that these antibodies appeared to perform any significant therapeutic benefit, we were able to use them to develop an enzyme-linked immunoassay to actually study this protein in the clinical um, environment. And so we've been able to see by doing that that indeed this placental-specific variant of soluble FLT does increase across gestation in normal women and that it's significantly increased in women that have preterm early onset preeclampsia compared to controls. It still performs its normal function in terms of antagonising the effects of VEGF and PLGF. And so this is then some work that we've gone on to try and test in a prospective fashion um, in the clinical environment. And so this is just um, some work that's still very preliminary, but it's work that I've been able to achieve with the help of um, Dr. Maya Reddy, who's a ONG registrar with us, who's also doing a PhD working with me on cardiovascular outcomes in preeclampsia and also assisted with this, and um, Saskia Rausen, who was a Bachelor of Medical Science student last year with me. And so we collected a number of blood samples from women who were attending our hospital uh, with suspected disease and tested them at that point in time to see how well did our placental specific variant identify those that were going to go on to be diagnosed with preeclampsia compared to the currently available commercial assays looking at total soluble FLT and placental growth factor. And so you'll be able to see from this data that indeed the, uh, the E15A variant didn't appear to perform uh, more favourably than the commercially available uh, platform. Certainly when we add, um, combine it with placental growth factor, it performs moderately well, um, but still certainly the commercially available assay uh, on these patients certainly performs the best. But um, it's just an example as well of how we've been able to actually translate something that's been developed in the laboratory through to testing in that clinical environment within just a few years. Um, and certainly this has led to ongoing collaboration as well with a few commercial biotech partners to actually look at trying to develop this assay further. Moving on to think about how we might be able to pursue our treatments to improve preeclampsia, because certainly as a clinician, our approach to managing preeclampsia has changed very little in many decades, and we have very limited approaches beyond really delivery of the mother and the placenta to treat this disease. And so I've been working as well with a, another very talented medical student who's doing a PhD with myself, uh, Sarah Marshall and Ewan Wallace. And she's produced some beautiful work in the laboratory looking at an antioxidant known as sulforaphane. So as you may remember, the preeclamptic the pre placenta is quite a hypoxic environment. We see increased expression of oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species throughout the placental bed, leading to an increase in those anti-angiogenic proteins.
Annie's been testing sulforaphane, which we find most commonly in broccoli sprout extracts um, within the laboratory. Sulforaphane itself works as an inducer of the NERF2 endogenous antioxidant pathway, increasing the expression of endogenous antioxidants within the cell. And we've done this in in vivo, in vitro and in vivo assays so far, where when we've exposed them to sulforaphane, we've seen that it does reduce the amount of oxidative stress, the expression of reoxidant, oxidative reactive oxygen species and that this has led to a reduction in anti-angiogenic protein expression by the placenta as well. So already um, thankfully sulforaphane exists in available Brocomax tablets that we can import from the US and so this is work that already we're in the process of actually translating through to the clinic. So we're doing a phase one pharmacokinetic trial as we speak. We've recruited about eight women so far to that study. We've got another four to go before that's finished to identify the dosing that we're going to use. And we've set up and got our ethics approval in place um, already for a phase two study that we're hoping to commence recruitment to later this year. And so the goal with this is that we may be able to treat women with sulforaphane versus placebo to actually see in those with early onset disease where currently the general duration from time of diagnosis to delivery on average is 13 days, which isn't great if you're only a 24 week gestation fetus, you're being delivered at 25 and a half weeks, which is a, not an ideal stage to be born at. So we're after a treatment that hopefully can enable us to prolong that gestational advancement beyond the 13 days. And so this is work that is already uh, underway and that we hope that we will have some interesting results on this front, hopefully by the end of next year. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on fetal growth restriction. So I mentioned already that this is a very common problem and associated with stillbirth, but it's also associated with significant morbidity to the surviving fetus. So we know that babies that are born following fetal growth restriction are born with less cortical cells, they show delayed myelination within their brains, and they have reduced brain volumes that we can see on MRI as well. But we also see issues with their heart development, pancreas and kidneys that really then set them up for a life where they do have increased rates of medical comorbidities across the rest of their lifespan. We also know that these babies have increased rates of neurodevelopmental impairment and high rates of cerebral palsy and this is work that Susie is going to touch on in much more detail. Currently, in terms of neurodevelopmental impairment, we tend to be able to diagnose that in early childhood, by which stage much of the brain development and the brain injury has actually already occurred and there aren't necessarily many treatment options available to mitigate or ameliorate that underlying structural brain damage. So most of our treatments at that stage really are about optimising the um, performance that a child might be able to achieve. So Susie and Ewan had hypothesised that actually if we could try and develop a treatment that we could apply to these babies when we pick them up antenatally as growth restricted, we might be able to actually institute a treatment at that stage that can mitigate that process before the, the brain damage has happened and while the brain is still undergoing a lot of its development. And so um, Susie's going to cover all of the underlying preclinical research in this space looking at melatonin, but her work has gone on and I've been able to join the team in terms of then translating that through to clinical trial. So I've come along and joined the team and set up the Protect Me trial, which we've actually just gone live three weeks ago at Monash Health. And so with this trial, it's a triple blinded randomised placebo controlled trial where we're recruiting women with early onset growth restriction and aiming to hopefully see an improvement in their child's neurodevelopment at two years of age. We're also going to be looking at does melatonin actually improve fetal growth during the pregnancy? What impact does it have on structural brain development and add to the safety data around the use of melatonin in pregnancy? And so, as I mentioned, we've just gone live at Monash um, and we are going to be rolling it out to a number of other sites along the Australian Eastern Seaboard as well as in New Zealand. And so with this trial, women will be randomised to either melatonin or placebo and with our power calculation, we're looking to recruit 332 participants to this trial. And this is, will, is powered to show a five point difference, which is a, a clinically meaningful difference on their Bailey's performance at two years of age. In terms of the trial, we're going to follow these children throughout fetal life, infancy and early childhood. Throughout pregnancy, we'll collect a range of blood samples and ultrasound markers before at birth going on to collect blood and placental samples. 
The children will have a number of neurodevelopmental assessments where we do a term corrected MRI looking for structural brain development and a general movements assessment at term and three months of age. The general movements assessment is a really useful predictive marker for subsequent cerebral palsy. And then at two years of age, they'll undergo an infant toddler social emotional assessment and a full Bailey's three, which assesses a number of domains across cognition, language and motor development. And so we've been going for three weeks and we've got four recruits so far, so just 328 to go. And um, I look forward to hopefully sharing the results of this with you in about five to six years time. But I hope I've been able to show you just some of the varied work that we're doing and the importance of both the fundamental research and then combining that as a broad team in terms of also translating that through to the clinic. And our goal is always to hopefully achieve healthy babies <coughs> born to healthy mums. None of this research ever happens in isolation. It's always part of a big team. And I'm certainly very blessed to work with some pretty amazing people across a range of institutions that have helped um, along the way with all of this research. Thank you.